Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. Is it on? Can you hear me? Nobody can ever hear me. So it's not ready. It's not ready. I'll talk loud. Hi, folks. My name is Nicole Trevina Flores. I'm the Global Ed Coordinator here at the college. So I really appreciate you all being here. We have a week of events. So hope you take note of our schedule there on the side. There's also Take one. Sign in materials if you're giving extra credit. There's also a drawing if you stay till the end. We'll do the drawings at the end of the week. But if you stay till the end of the event, you can enter into a drawing, students. So um, I want to thank you for being here. I know everybody's very busy, especially this time of year, but we want to honor our international students. We want to honor our international education, and that's why we all come together during this week every year. We are thrilled to have three guest speakers to talk about inclusive language and foreign language this morning. So we're going to start with German inclusive language, and we'll kind of go through a list of other folks in their discussions. But thank you, and, and please ask questions as you have them. Hi. I'm Nikki Eisman and I teach German and political science on the Lincoln campus specifically. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do. Let's see if everything is gonna work technology-wise um, about how this works um, in the German language. And if you have taken French or Spanish or German before, you know that we have articles. Now let's see if this is gonna go. It's not advancing. Yeah. All right, there we go. So in German, as in other um, of the German, French and other languages like that, we have gendered nouns. And so if you've taken German before, some students in here are my German students, you will know that we um, use the, um, the gendered nouns. Like for example, if you see the first sentence here, it says der Tisch, which is the table. And then it uses the pronoun er, which means it is new. And the sentence here, der Tisch er ist neu. Oh, it doesn't have the T on the end of that word. Well, that's what happens when you type. Anyway, der er ist neu. So what happens? That means that we are going to um, identify everything from, and the, you see in this example, a fork, a knife, a spoon, all of those, whoa, advanced too far. All of those have our, um, we, they all have a version of an article that goes with them. So if I'm gonna talk about a, a fork, knife, and spoon, it becomes, which through no logical sense, die Gabel, das Messer, der Löffel is all of our fork, knife, and spoon. Why is it a feminine fork? Why is it a neuter you know, knife? Why is it a feminine spoon? We don't know, or a masculine spoon, we don't know. These just are the way that we work in the German language. So what does this mean when we are, thank you. Aha, Kara's up here to advance. What does it mean when we are um, doing uh, all of that with a gendered noun language? That's one thing, but why is it important when we wanna talk about people from that um, standpoint? Well, people in German are also um, through a gendered perspective. You can advance to the next slide. Thank you very much. Oh, is it not gonna advance? No, trouble. No, oh, dang, what happened here, buddy? Oh, too far, too far. There we go, that's one. Oh, it is advancing with this. I think you got it to hook up. Okay, so if we're talking about people and social and cultural groups, we know that in the in English language specifically, we've been working for a long time to identify, instead of saying a, a waitress or a waiter, we now say wait staff or wait person. And we've been doing this in English language for at least 30 years that we've been trying to use inclusive language, but in German, everything is identified by male or female. So for example, if you see here, we have Ein Arzt, which you identify the doctor as a male doctor. And for a female doctor, we say eine Arztin or die Arztin, and it has an I-N ending. And if we're going to talk about a mechanic, you have the male mechanic as an Automechaniker with an E-R ending, and the female has an I-N all the way through. So I have several different words up in here that you can see. And now what we're trying to do in German, not me personally, but the German um, organizations and are trying to figure out how to be more inclusive. And this is difficult because every noun that identifies every profession, every person, every citizen, every person from a different country is identified by male or female. So this is becoming difficult. Some of the solutions they've come up with include making everybody plural. So instead of saying der Lehrer or der Lehrerin for a teacher that's identified as male or female, they're now saying people who teach, all the plurals. So we're gonna use just D, which is the way you identify plurals, Lehrerin. So that's gonna be the whole world we're gonna, uh, the way we're gonna talk about all those who teach, which is tedious, but it's what we're doing in language. Another solution is to do this idea where you see the next one down here where it talks about citizens, where it says Bürger, Usually we can identify, like if we say um, burger, we mean a citizen. There's something called a generic masculine. I'll show you in a minute. But we now do underline and then burgerinnen or die burgerinnen. And you see where it says a capital I in the middle of that? Let's see if this will work for me. Ha ah, 
I can use a capital I. So this underscore capital I is one way to do it. And if you see this in like um, news media or in TikToks or any of those things when they're referring to male or female plurals, they're now doing an underline with a capital I here rather than as you see with this I in here. And that's one way to do it. Another solution is to use the asterisk or in German they refer to this as the star. If you use the um, star in here, you could do it so like this one for programmers. If you're talking about computer programmers, this is one long word. I think you're aware that German just stacks words together to make very long words. As you see, like this one, this is the, um, the Council for German Rules. And so this is for the writing rules. That's the word for writing, or rights and rules. So now we have the Council for German Orthography. So we're now putting together the rules in place to make sure everybody's on the same page. Now, how easy do you think it is for everybody to get on the same page? Everybody in academia, everybody in the newspaper and media, and everybody in um, the academics are out there. No, nobody's on the same page here. So this has been a challenge for German. So for example, here's one of the ways that we've tried to you know, work in German to make this something that everybody will accept. Rather than calling a community center, just a basic place like a community center, if we were going to use what we call the generic masculine, and we have this in English, you guys know when we say something like all men are created equal, that is supposed to be a generic masculine where all men means male and female created equal. However, you know, certainly those who are in feminist theory will argue that doesn't mean me. I'm not included in all men are created equal. We want to say all people are created equal or something to that effect. And there's a whole thing about that. Seneca Falls Convention, 1948, they wanted to write the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments that included women. Well, that's been going on in our country for a very long time. Germany, they're just catching up. So now they want to revert, get rid of this generic masculine. And now they're trying to do things like this one to say, well, are we going to call it the Bürger? And here's our star in and house, which includes females and every non-binary individual. Or this is what they've decided to do, the house of meeting. So now we call it House der Begegnung. So that's what we have now, just the meeting house. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to go with the plural ideas to bring everybody in. Okay, so we've done this in English. You've seen this happen, where rather than causing um, calling things by male or female, we just go to the person or the human or the team member or the guest. It's like when you go into a classroom and you say, Hello, citizens, rather than saying, hello, ladies and gentlemen, what can you do that would be all inclusive in your language? But if you start from a place of gender to begin with in everything you do, you're obviously leaving everybody out. So that becomes the challenge. And we're working in, you know, obviously in English and in countries like French, France and Spain, Spanish and in German to be more inclusive. This has become in Germany very political. So you have those on the far left of the parties, the political parties who are trying to be more inclusive and those on the very right, right, right. There's, I don't wanna tell you this, but there is a group that's becoming more like the Nazis of old who are trying to not do this and wanna make it very gender specific. So that's happening in political in society. So the generic masculine I'm talking about is this idea. So what are we doing? In Germany, if we're not using the star or we're not using the gender nouns, we're doing this. They have created new versions of pronouns. So instead of having, as you see in this pronoun version, where you can see, um, <laughs> back up one, can you do that? Oh, no, care. there we go, we're back to this one. Yep, if you can see how we have third person, pronoun, third person pronouns like we use in English, if we're going to say something like my aunt, she lives in Kreuzberg, it's an area in Berlin. If we're going to talk about that, so we have meine Tante, that's my aunt. What could we do if we want to change this completely? Well, now they're coming up with different pronouns entirely. So if we have a name like Max, normally you would think Max is a male name, but no, if we're going to be non-binary, they're coming up with this new pronoun. You can say de wohnt in Kreuzberg or das ist Mika. Zia, this is a whole combination of she and er. Instead of saying she or he, you're going to say Zia will nach Berlin reisen. They will travel to Berlin or combining it this way, Z-I-E-R. So they're combining them together. Getting wild, but they're trying to be, convert, um, to be conversant with our current pop politics and putting them together. So what do you think? Have you studied with um, a foreign language before, like French or German or Spanish? and seeing these kinds of pronouns, well, it's very difficult. No one has decided in Germany or in France how to do it all the same way. So it's kind of like the United States where we have somewhat agreed that we will use they for the plural and then we're settled. 
It hasn't worked out in Germany or France or Spain. They're not decided on how they're gonna make this work. Okay, that's the German way. So <laughs> confusion, but we're working it out. How about um, in a place like Kenya or we have Danvis next. I'm gonna talk, oh, you have the lapel mic if you wanna use it. Um, in Kenya, we don't have, uh, we don't have this, uh, we don't have she or he. Once you want to say this person is male, you have to you have to make a sentence. Or a female, this person is female. We we have to make a sentence. Otherwise, we don't have that distinction between between males and and females. So, for example, other words that are confusing here are say when you say I love you. So for us. In Swahili, I love you is just nakupenda, which is a general word that we use for I love you or I like you. So we don't have that distinction. And we can use these for both males and females. And the, another thing that is a little bit confusing here is uh, the words like handsome and beautiful. Is it okay for us to say this man is beautiful? How would you feel if somebody called you that? Or can we call girls, oh, this girl here is very handsome. Is that okay? So those words are in English. We don't have those in Swahili. So in Swahili, you have to make a full sentence for us to comprehend exactly what you are talking about. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sandeep. Um, my cultural background, I, I come from India, but I've been in US for almost 30 years. So I have essentially forgotten my uh, language. So when uh, Kara asked me, I had to actually do some research about my own language because I don't speak that very fluently anymore. Um, <clears throat> for India, the languages is extremely complicated uh, structure. One is this, Essentially, India has a population of about 1.4 billion people. I come from a state that has close to about uh, um, 120 million people. And my state has a language called Marathi, which is what I'm fluent in, or that's what my parents speak, and um, or that was my mother tongue. But when you cross the state line, or if you go to the neighboring state, the language is totally different. Uh, so you either rely on a national language, which is Hindi, or so, some of the Southern Indian uh, cultures are totally different languages, which I can't even uh, recognize or pronounce. So I rely on English. So the languages in India are very complicated uh, in that sense. So whenever you are trying to do the uh, the inclusive language, you do have to be careful. So that's one part because of the diversity of the country. The second part is within the state, uh, the language changes very rapidly. Uh, we have a saying in my state that the language will change even Marathi language, my language changes the dialect of things every 40 miles. So my sister-in-law, when she got married, she, uh, to my brother, she was from uh, a town which was about 100 miles. And when she came to our household, some of the things she would say, would I would not be able to even understand it. She has to basically write it out to for me to understand it. Uh, and it, it's just a culturally different way of saying. Now, so those are those are sort of a uh, disclaimers about the languages. As far as the inclusiveness of the language, the most of the Indian language, the Hindi as well as uh, my Marathi language, come from the ancient language of Sanskrit. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, uh, and lot of the international languages have Sanskrit as a base. So a, a lot of the grammars as well as pronouns or things are dictated by how it was described in ancient times in Sanskrit. So 
uh, the way you say he or way you say she is actually determined by the context uh, as well as uh, the ancient way of how the language uh, progressed. Now, if you have if you have ever seen a Bollywood movie, which is a Hollywood version of uh, the movies, you would pop if you look at the uh, movie in 1960s or 70s, and if you watch a recent movie, you would know distinct you would notice the distinction between the uh, the clarity of the language as well as the Western influence on the Hindi language and uh, the Marathi languages. So there is there is a lot of influx of, of what Nikki was saying, how the plurality uh, oh, okay. okay. Uh, so a uh, lot of the Western cultures are having influence on international languages. Uh, and since English is so prominently spoken and communicated in India, that actually has a significant impact on uh, how inclusive the local languages are becoming. So uh, uh, somebody is saying he or she or uh, they, uh, or if a person of a transgender uh, uh, orientation, how should that person be addressed? It is often influenced by how it is said in English and people will try to see how, to, how it will match in the local language. So uh, there, there are confluences of various sort of aspects that come into play. Um, so uh, so if you do happen to travel to India, be uh, the one of the thing you do have to respect is you can get by in India with totally speaking English, but if you want to talk to a local vendor or something, uh, if you are talking to a female vendor, what uh, you you would probably uh, say uh, a female pronoun, uh, uh, it, they won't get offended, even if the vendor might be uh, a uh, of a, bi a, 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 a the binary uh, orientation uh, type thing. So, uh, un unless it is clear, uh, so there are clear distinctions on how the language structure is done, uh, but the structurally language is inclusive, but there are a lot of uh, other in influences that is affecting how current language is uh, being uh, spoken as well as written, so. So um, um, also, uh, I have also lived in the US. I, I'm sorry that I didn't mention this, for more than 20 years. So kind of uh, my language is also not very good. And one of the challenges I've faced in my life is uh, when I was at K-State, I was in, I invited to teach an, in an anthropology class, teach my own language because it's not documented. Uh, that was one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. Uh, I had to call Kenya all the time just to ask questions. And unfortunately, some of those people were not even able to tell me most of the things that I wanted. In a language, asking the why question has been the most difficult part of learning a language. Why are they doing it this way? And suppose I translate it and uh, put it in the other way. I mean, what's your name again? David. David has tried to learn Swahili with me. I speak seven languages. And so... He was interested in Swahili, and he also came up with those questions. Can we can we change this structure and put it this way? Language sometimes does not go that way. It's a, it's a little bit complicated. And if you are a translator, that even becomes, because if you change just one word, the whole meaning of the whole thing goes away. And so we cannot translate a language word to word. It will not make sense. But also uh, when it comes to LGBTQ, uh, Africa has not come up with a lot of terms on that, and it's something that we don't even openly like talk about. So we do have some terms there, trying to be a little bit more neutral here and there, but I can assure you that people are going to be very, very shy, especially in the public, trying to discuss that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
I was going to um, tell you a little bit more about where some of the legislation has gone for language use in different countries. For example, you know, we obviously in the United States have, we do not have an official language academy, but some countries do. So for example, um, Spain has been discussing inclusive language and it's evolving. There's obviously, a, it's a very um, inclusive and we've had a lot of um, immigrants who come from different parts of the world into Spain or into you know France, clearly the United States has that. Sweden has had an influx of, of immigrants who come into their country, but um, the countries of Spain and Germany have been more inclusive in development with their language, but um, they do not have in Spain the organization that we see in France. France is something called the Academy Francois, if you're familiar with this, and they are um, arbitrating what can be included in the French language, which is an official um, organization that they have. And they've even gone as far to have a coalition of their members of parliament draft legislation that introduces a specific bill that bans the use of gender neutral language um, among officials of government and civil servants and across um, the general official documents in France, which is the opposite of being inclusive for language. And Germany, as I mentioned, has their various inclusion, um, various elements, and they do have an organization that tries to speak to it. But who is pushing the use of inclusive language is um, a dictionary company called Duden, and they are trying to move closer to allowing different inclusive languages. They have not embraced the effort of um, Z, of the things I showed you with the pronouns. They are not pushing that at all. But it's the dictionary company that's doing it there. For the formal English language in the United Kingdom, there is a group called, or an organization called the Oxford English Dictionary. You may have heard of that. And that is the definitive arbiter of English language there called the OAE. In the United States, we have one dictionary standard that includes words, which I'm not a fan of the words that they include. It's called Webster's. Have you heard of this? Mm -hmm. So every year you might see the new list of words that get included in the English American language. But both with the AOE and with the um, Webster's Dictionary, what they are including are things that are in use, which is different than arbitrating what can or cannot be included. So in the French Academy, they are including what, what they want to be the language standard, whereas the Oxford English Dictionary and the Webster's Dictionary are including what is permitted, I mean, what is being used, the, the English versions. The French Academy, what can't be. Sweden, thank you, Sweden. They are actually trying to include, like much like we have, They've gone to a gender, uh, what you saw in the German presentation, they have included a gender neutral um, pronoun. It's actually, I don't know how many of you speak Swedish, are you moving on it? The Swedish language they are speaking with Ken, um, they use that, that pronoun to be a gender neutral pronoun as opposed to using the she or the he version. So they've um, allowed that, but that's actually gone so far as to be included in their parliament and they passed that. So in 2014, that's pretty progressive in 2014, they um, passed it in place. And we're seeing actually in our House of Representatives, and um, as far back as 2008, our Congress passed that we would have a neutral, um, gender neutral contract for inclusive, more inclusive language in government official documents, which is a good thing. So if we are going to allow for more inclusive language, at least in government documents, I think that's kind of a positive direction that we're going. So that's where we are as far as government official language and the things that we're doing as far as how official languages are set. So that's where we're getting a little more reflective. And like I said, it's either going to move through government documents, it's going to go through um, legislative actions, or what's done with the dictionary publications. You see it happening in media, but media is not like a standard. And as you know, in the United States, we don't have state government media. So in places like Russia, they have state-sponsored media. Um, Great Britain actually has a lot of state-sponsored media too. And they create their standards. And then what you see media using generally trickles down is what the general population will use as well. Um, but we do not have standards across media in the United States. We have all private media and also whatever happens on Twitter. I'll call that real media, but that's there. So that's what we see is happening in common practice. Do you guys have any questions for us? Well, I just want to add okay. one, one, one thing what Nikki has said. One of the things that affects the language as well as communication is the political situations. Uh, so depending on, uh, you probably have seen a lot of unrest in various areas, uh, radicalization either from right or left uh, in uh, African countries always, it's, it's, uh, India currently has a Hindu nationalist uh, government. So they try to push the, uh, the very purest way of looking at uh, the culture uh, the Indian language has had uh, significant 
uh, Persian influence because India was ruled by Persian emperors. So they we have a lot of uh, words that were come came from Arabic uh, languages. Uh, so those are uh, one of the the purest. Uh, the Hindu nationalists are trying to get out of the things. They are even thinking of changing the name of the country from India to Bharat, which used to be a sort of a old uh, name of the uh, country back in uh, early ages. So. Uh, so that can have impact on what the communications and how the language is developing too. So. Oh, yeah. You're changing your name of the country That's because right. of this you know, colonial or mm -hmm. empire relationship. Uh, hi, um, my name is Carla Engstrom, and I teach American Sign Language, which is uh, predominantly used in the United States and Canada. Um, it's uh, different than British Sign Language, French Sign Language, German Sign Language, Swahili. If you have a critical population, if you have a, a good man, a number of people, you'll by the second generation or so, you'll probably have a, a language, is what most people say. When it comes to genders, really, um, you know, you can say boy, girl, man, woman, but when you're talking to somebody in the room, there's absolutely no reason to use he or she because what your eyes do is look at the person and you're kind of, it gets translated to you, you know, but you're pointing to this person and it could be male or it could be female. It doesn't really matter. Um, not trying to say that it doesn't have some of its problems, but when you, since it lives with English and it tries to have people go to school and whatnot, then they might come up with more, um, you can do, a, uh, you would do girl in point and boy in point and you get he and she, but that's much more academic than it is actually happening. I mean, people really don't do that kind of stuff at meetings or when they're out for coffee or anything like that. Um, when it comes to LBGTQA+, they, it, I wanted to show a video, but we didn't know if we were going to have this, but the, the, the deaf people in America have developed terms. They have developed terms for gay, lesbian, trans, um, bi, um, kind of go blank on some stuff, but yeah, there, there are terms that have been developed in there, um, and, and everybody's, I think in academia, the movement has been, let's wait until we see what the community is using and then we will adopt that sign. We will, um, if, if it is acceptable to them, then we will use that. So, um, one of the, the other things I was gonna, when it comes to inclusiveness, um, in American Sign Language, I, I mean, uh, you know, nor, it's basically Christian and Northern European. It's kind of hard to get around that. Um, but ye, at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., where many, many foreign, foreign students have come, um, one of the tendencies now is to, instead of using the ASL sign for the country, uh, to use their country sign. So, okay. So for most of the Asian ones, I didn't invent this, okay. <laughs> but um, let's just say China and Jap Japanese or Japan. Uh, it, long time ago, I guess, when you're white and you're looking at somebody, this is how it went. So this would be China and this would be Japan. And now you will find old deaf people who will argue with you and say, that is my language and these are my signs and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and the twain shall never meet. But so the movement has been to use China, which is their sign, and I do understand that it is a humongous country, so it probably has a few other signs, but it, it has come to represent a traditional coat. Um, uh, and then Japan is for the shape of the island. So it, and that is the sign they use in Japan for Japanese or the, or the country. So that has been the movement to 
um, use inclusively, you know, use what they deem to be an acceptable term for the country. And it's usually b uh, based on either the flag, um, uh, man-made, or I probably shouldn't say that, a natural resource or something like, um, dang, what do you say, man-made, what's other? You know, like Paris, this is Paris and it's for the Eiffel Tower. So it's either something like that or um, it might be in some places a very traditional kind of clothing that they have for, um, uh, you know, dancing or whatever they wherever they wear. So, yeah, and I was going to show a video on all our new LBGTQ signs, but maybe next time. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? And besides, uh, you know, you can take our la these languages here. You get credit for them, people. <laughs> Well, German um, doesn't really, I mean, we have words that are out of fashion. The, the more, um, I think German keeps most of its words because we have a really fun thing you can do by attaching every word together and making the longest word you can imagine. <laughs> but we develop new words just like like all the words just surrounding the pandemic, like lockdown and you know all the things that we've had that. So new words evolve all the time. But I think one of the things that I think is hilarious about German is the fact that you can stack words together. And some of you know my favorite German words are things like the word Treppenwitze, which is the word for, it means step and joke. So we have Treppen, which is word for steps and Witze, but it's the comeback you think of after you walk away from a conversation. You know, many times you think, oh, I wish I thought of that. That's a, what you call a Treppenwitze, a step joke. And I think that's a great word. We don't have that in English. And then you guys might've heard the word before, Schadenfreude. And that's a great word. It's even been used on a Simpsons episode before. But schadenfreude is the word for the joy you feel at someone else's pain. And that's another good word we don't have in English. So you can use that. And it's um, a word that describes, you know, when you hear of someone you don't like that just got fired from their job and you're like, oh, okay, that's too bad. And it's really not bad. And you don't even think it's a good thing, but you, it's something that happened that's sad, but on the other hand, you have joy. So that's a, a great word we have in German that we don't have in English. So there's just some words that we have better at describing in German, which I think are great. Those are the two ones I like. Yeah, in, in uh, Marathi and Hindi, a uh, lot of the old Sanskrit words that used to be part of the language are no longer used just because of the Western influence of them. They basically just, people just forgot. And uh, if you ask the newer, if, if there is a conversation between if my grandfather, uh, would, uh, if he was alive today, he, if he talks to a young person, he would probably have a little bit hard time understanding the language. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, rapidly changing that quickly. Uh, the language he was speaking uh, was very pure uh, at that time. Uh, was almost like a Sanskrit base. And the languages now are basically more Western, Western influence languages. So the, the newer people would try to uh, replicate uh, English, literally an English word into Marathi or Hindi and uh, uh, say that word as if it belongs in Marathi or Hindi rather than it, it is just the, you are saying English word, but you are writing in Marathi. So you were, and, she mentioned the social media. Sometimes you would see people typing your language in English. So uh, if, if they want to say, my name is uh, uh, Sandeep in Marathi, so Maze now Sandeep, they would basically type M-A-Z-E, is basically just read, uh, uh, type the, instead of using the script for the Marathi language, they would basically use. And that's how people start speaking too. So uh, it, it's becoming rather strange way of communication, actually. So that's uh, that's uh, that's one reason why a lot of the current uh, language sometimes become unrecognizable for older people. So one of the challenges that we are facing uh, in Africa is, uh, I mean, there are around seven thousand languages in the world, and out of those seven thousand, uh, twenty nearly 20 of them every year 
are in endangered languages, they are disappearing. And once their language disappears, their culture also disappears. So how many languages we have in Africa? We have around 1,400 languages. Uh, where I come from Kenya, we have around 42 languages. And actually recently they included Indian. The Indian population in Kenya has been there for a long time, but the uh, Kenyan government has not been recognizing the Indians in Kenya until recently now we have the 43rd tribe is Indian. And uh, in Kenya is very, very interesting because sometimes I get confused what language that I'd be speaking now. Is it Swahili, which is dominantly what is spoken most, or my indigenous language, which is Kisi, which is not even documented. It's also listed as endangered uh, language. Uh, in the series, you will find what uh, Sandeep is trying to say, a mixture of languages. Uh, we borrow a lot of languages from different parts of the world. Like, for example, Swahili has borrowed heavily from uh, the Arabic language. But we also pull a lot of languages, I mean, words from Germany. So Swahili is thought to be, it belongs to nobody. It's a language that was used by business people who arrived in Africa, the Portuguese, and all these people, Arabs, Indians, and they came up together and came up with that language. But some people tend to say, oh, we own this language. And they kind of, if they speak, you'll hear their language, they speak the way they speak is a little bit more fluent than the way probably I speak. In the series, young kids have developed their own language. It's not official. They're trying to push it to be official. It's called Sheng. Sheng is a mixture of English words and Swahili. And for example, if they were talking about father, they don't want to say father, they want to say father. They are trying to modify. So that is a language sometimes when these young kids speak, I don't even get a word. It's like, what are they saying? Unless you are in part of them. And this is a language they use either to hide from what they are doing with their parents or the police officers. For example, if they are doing illegal things, you might not even understand what they're saying. So language is evolving. One of the interesting thing about Swahili, since we have borrowed not only Swahili, even my indigenous language, is that we have all uh, things that are technical, like computers, TV, radio. Those words are just used in the same way they are. They have tried to come up with words uh, in Swahili that represent, say, radio. Now we have a Swahili word for that. But for a long time, we have been using radio as radio, TV as TV, car as in car. But now they're trying, actually, the main center of Swahili is in Yale University. That's where they are creating these new terms. Uh, some of them that I've not even learned myself. So African languages are still developing. They are not like English. We're not going to get a lot of vocabulary in African languages like what you do guys have in English. And that is, we're still trying to develop. One other thing that happens in languages, it's uh, one topic I saw when Kera sent me the invite towards the discrimination that sort of plays into uh, languages and how that is addressed. Uh, in in India, it actually works backward. Uh, the people are discriminated because they don't speak how they are expected to speak. So if if people with coming from villages uh, or something, if they don't speak as cleanly or purely or grammatically correct uh, uh, proper Marathi, even though they can get their point across, if they are not speaking it correctly, they are immediately considered as backward uh, class. Uh, you, you are just, even though they, they are hardworking farmers or things, but the way they are speaking, uh, they have a different tones, uh, they may address uh, uh, male and female differently than how uh, the city person would address it. So that can, people start looking down uh, on them right away based on, because oh, this, this person doesn't even know how to speak. And, uh, and uh, that actually doesn't only happen in India, but my wife is Thai and Thai, for those of you who don't know, uh, 
Thai language, Thai language has way a lot of tones. So if you don't speak the correct tones, and uh, I don't even attempt to do it because my language is very uh, static. Uh, and, and if I don't pronounce the correct tone, it completely means different things. And when, when we go travel within Thailand to various towns, uh, sometimes uh, my, my wife has to rely on locals because uh, the way, the, uh, the, even though they are speaking the, the correct uh, Thai language, uh, the tonal differences can affect how the language is interpreted. Uh, so the vendor may say something completely different and prime it, it, it some of that is because of the lack of education or not having access to uh, the uh, more advanced training or things a lot of their learning is from uh, interaction with uh, the locals and only in your area but what she she had mentioned to me that uh, whenever we travel like this if the people are not speaking correct Thai they are often looked down uh, because it's oh that that's not a pure Thai. What what type of language you are speaking? So that can well, languages can have that effect of uh, you know, looking down on the people or discriminating based on uh, how how someone is speaking or writing and things. Uh, in India, it is actually very uh, recognized. I mean, I, I knew about the uh, transgender people. Uh, and uh, LGBT issues back when I was in college uh, too. How much it is recognized by society is a totally different issue actually. Uh, the societal norms are very rigid in, in India, especially because they are driven by 
uh, <clears throat> uh, the current politics as well as uh, uh, the environment they are in. But as far as uh, recognition of them, uh, and that's also quite prevalent in Thailand too. Uh, Thailand has fairly large transgender uh, community um, and they actually uh, have their own shows and performances uh, and that some of that actually happens in India but uh, I do have to say that those people uh, are by society in general are looked down upon that there is something wrong with you um, so um, <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of the parents would basically would uh, uh, say don't talk to them that can have bad influence so on you so uh, so people are aware of it but how it society accept it is a different issue yes. uh. again in africa we are still struggling with this um, most countries are not open to it uh, actually uh, our neighboring country uganda uh, passed a law i think the us is protesting that that if you are found uh, practicing homosexual then it's 10 years in prison and so it's not something that uh, they will uh, allow academicians come up with the terms. Uh, but currently what we do have is, if you're talking about, say, bisexual, it's not going to be one word. And like they'll make a whole sentence trying to explain what type of person you're talking about. Okay, So we, we still not developed that. Um, oh yeah, there's, there, there, are, hmm, there are a lot of, um, since deafness kind of runs in families, um, there's also, uh, I would say a large percentage of, um, uh, gayness, uh, lesbianness in, um, in deaf families. Um, there are, there are, I teach signs like in the first level. So we get a little inkling of how to sign gay, lesbian, you know, transgendered, um, drag queen, you know, things like that. Um, and for example, like the president of Gallaudet University is a gay woman, so, or a lesbian. So, I mean, there's, it's very acceptable in some ways, but yes, there's still, you know, traditional hardcore people on the right or Christians that, uh, I didn't mean to say that so harshly, but they are, you know, not so supportive or wanting to be inclusive. Um, is that what you meant? Yeah. And by the way, um, you can learn talking about, I tried to, I wanted to learn a little Tibetan. There is no way I, at my age, I'm going to be able to do a phonetic language, a tonal language. I'm just like, so if you have kids and if, you're, it's a good thing you're doing it now while you're young, but you know you help your kids learn another language when they're little. Really do that. Whatever it is, help them, and it really then the third language isn't going to be that hard. I'm serious. So really, you know, encourage people to take other languages and learn about another culture. And I'm so happy to see that most of you are doing that here. It's so cool, and. Uh, like I said, oh, and also the thing I've been studying about deaf people is if you are language deprived, and I think this happens to any human, but if you don't get language by between the ages of zero to five, you, excuse me, are screwed. You will have many developmental things you just can't do. It's kind of like being left in a closet or raised by wolves. You know, it's just not a good deal. Uh, so uh, and this happens to deaf people a lot where they think they can just talk to them. So you're making this poor little kid just work. Just, what are you? Bah, 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 bah. Oh, that's, that's um, here's a not very nice sign for hearing people. Blah, blah, blah. Your mouth just moves. <laughs> so, you know, there's signs like that. But yeah, you know. Don't let anybody be language deprived if you can help it. 
I, I, I do want to echo the, uh, I have a, a 28 year old daughter uh, who has been trying to learn Thai a little bit. Uh, and when she was growing up, uh, when we don't speak Thai in her home. Um, the only time my uh, wife would speak Thai is if she's talking to her family. So that's the only exposure. But if you have any way of uh, engaging uh, the young kids uh, in another language, do it early because they really pick up the languages very quickly. Um, and we, we try to spend extended time in Asia with the grandparents and uh, only time she would be able to talk to her grandmother is basically uh, just waving, making signs. I'm hungry, I'm full, or it's delicious, like a few things, but no engagement beyond that. And uh, she always felt bad uh, that she wasn't able to communicate better. Uh, and if you have that cultural things, uh, if, if you can go and communicate in the local languages, it's impossible to learn all the languages, but if you have a prom prominent inclination that you may be going to a particular place often and uh, so try to pick up the language as quickly as possible. So one thing that I want also to add, I just uh, uh, do not think that uh, we don't have homosexuals and lesbians in Africa. That's not what I mean. They are there. You can do it. Do not go to the open. We do have most of our schools in Africa, our boarding schools. We do know this. There's that practice in there, the prisons are there. The only problem is do not go to the public like you can do here in the U.S. Uh, recently, I think uh, there was a U.N. meeting here and the Kenyan president was here. And the CNN, I think uh, her name is Christian Amanpour, was trying to interview the Kenyan president and was asking him about LGBT. And he said, don't even bring up that topic. We don't have a problem with that. And he said, like, it's a why can't you... He said, no, 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 we have not reached that po uh, point of where it's a problem. It's not a problem, so we don't talk about it. So he refused to talk anything about that. Right. Anything else? Accents are very, very important to me. I don't mind about accents. I like when people break even my language. It makes me very happy. Some people want to break the language. They, they get really mad. But I can assure you that if we have around 7,000 languages in the world, you don't want to expect people not to have accents. And so it's going to be wrong for people just to say, ah, you're not speaking in the way I speak. What about you try to speak my own language? So accents, uh, some of my friends actually speak another language. When they speak my language and they break it, it makes me very happy. <laughs> not, not very mad. Until some of them realize that I keep on enjoying that and say, I'm not going to speak your language anymore because you are getting too much fun out of it. But even that's culturally specific. <laughs> Different countries, you don't always love it when you try to speak their language. And I'm talking about you, France. Yeah. So, <laughs> Germans will love it. You try to speak German, that's perfectly fine. But yeah, it is, uh, but that's a culturally specific thing. I do have a question. Uh, sign language. Mm -hmm. um, human beings, we, we're talking about 7,000 languages in the world. Mm -hmm. And we don't anticipate anytime soon to have one language. So the French would speak their language. Uh, the only countries that are, do not have a common language is Africa. So with the sign language, I thought that is the area where human beings could have formed one common language. Why? Why not sign language? Okay. Um, well, because it really your culture is dependent upon your language. I know that sounds funny, but it really is your language. So I, when I was very young, learning sign language, went to an international festival in, uh, in Washington, D.C. People all over the world came, and I went to Japanese plays, I went, a sign language play, all in that. And I thought, oh, maybe I can get eat, drink, sleep. Okay. Our houses are like this. 
in Thailand, they're like this. They're built on stilts. We, you know, some people eat like this. Some people eat like this. I mean, that might be one, maybe. But it, no, we do things differently all over the world. We're not the same. Um, not at all. It's just, and it's because, well, for me, sometimes people don't think sign language is a real language. That's my problem. So I have to like, you know, yeah, I think it's going to be an easy language. Well, maybe, maybe the first few chapters, but after that, no, absolutely not. It has its own sentences and grammar structure. German is different. I cannot understand British sign language. We spell with one hand. They spell with two. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need an interpreter. Somebody help me. <laughs> you know, and so it's just different all over the world. And there are linguistics uh, specialists who are going around trying to uh, tape like Mexican sign language because a lot of those people are, are kind of dying out and it's really been heavily influenced by people from Gallaudet, that university I mentioned, who send students out all over and then start to work with kids in their countries. And I don't know, it's kind of kind of get heavily influenced by Americans that way, which would get rid of the native language. And even um, there is, quote unquote, an international language, which, OK, I, all right, all right. And then I asked them, well, what about the Asian language? I mean, I can see where it's coming from Northern Europe, but what about how they think in Asia or in, uh, you know, uh, some other country? Um, and they go, oh, well, maybe not. So there isn't even an international sign language, really. They'll tell you there might be, but it's more for people who have more things in common than not, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, we do have that, like in Swahili, we do have, uh, uh, when you say something like it, that just, it doesn't have any gender, we, we just say that thing, so it doesn't have any gender, in it. We, we do have that, we have gender neutral language, but it's, uh, it's uh, you have to dig out and maybe make a sentence to understand exactly what we're talking about, but we do, there are so many things that are gender neutral. In Native American languages, and I'm not an expert, it's just a workshop I went to, but um, they, uh, when it comes to transgendered or, or they, they, they are more inclusive and more accepting. Now, I don't know whether that answers your question about whether, they, whether or not that developed from within, but it, I don't know, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Because it invokes the spirit. And that's not a negative connotation. Right. For example, in India, I know they, yeah. they do have the, um, a third sex concept, but it's considered a, shame, a shameful thing. And as, okay. as Sandy mentioned, that you know it's way down on the caste system, which is no longer legal, but it's very prevalent still in the Indian culture. It is like what it is driven by the cultural norms. So I think the language is evolving based on what the cultural norms are. And I think over the next 50 to 100 years, we would probably see totally different type of language. So. Make sure if you, if you have no more questions first, you know where to find us. We all teach here. We all have email addresses you can easily find. 
but you can also sign up and make sure you get um, you are attached to the opportunity to earn swag for the races. Thank you, Officer President. So thank you very much. Thank you.